On today's Locked on Jayhawks, previewing the Kansas TCU game ahead of Saturday's action between two of the upper echelon teams in the Big 12. You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. As well on Rock Chalk Sports Talk, Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. on KLWN in Lawrence. Thanks for making Locked on Jayhawks your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get any of your podcasts. And on today's edition of the show, we're going to be breaking down, previewing the Kansas first TCU matchup set for Saturday. You'll be able to hear it on KLWN, pregame 1030, tip off at noon, and also on our sister station, 105.9 KISS. Today's episode, though, is brought to you by Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. So we start with our top storylines, then we'll move to our TCU scouting report, finish up with our matchups of the game. The top storylines, uh, I guess from a KU perspective, it's Kansas trying to bounce back. You suffer your first loss of the calendar year of 2023. You suffer your first loss since the Tennessee game. You f- suffer your first loss of Big 12 play. Now you're trying to bounce back, and that has been something that Bill Self has done at such a high rate in his time at Kansas. Pretty much every stat you put out there, it's like, oh, Bill Self has this unbelievable winning percentage. Um, And that's the case as well when he's coming off of losses. Like, very rarely does he lose back-to-back games. Now, that doesn't mean it's not impossible. It can happen, and it has happened before. And TCU almost beat KU in Allen Fieldhouse last year, and they uh, beat him in Fort Worth a season ago. But for Kansas, even though it's a tough opponent, they're trying to bounce back. TCU's trying to bounce back, too, though. They, they just lost to West Virginia earlier this week on the road, and maybe we're looking ahead a little bit to the KU game. But for Kansas, it's imperative to do so. Uh, Kansas State, who's tied for first with you in the Big 12, technically K-State ahead if the Big 12 tournament were to start today. They're playing Texas Tech at home, so you'd assume that's going to be a, an easy win for them. And uh you know, you want to stay kind of in positioning with them. And then K-State plays at Iowa State on Tuesday. So you want to, you know, keep winning and hope that one of those teams loses. I mean, obviously they will when they play each other. And then you can kind of move in front um, in that regard. Now, the other storyline here is, uh, like I said, with the TCU matchup a season ago, TCU was was kind of a, a tough matchup for KU in their two regular season meetings last season what does that mean to this year obviously Kansas is so different but there are you know several players back like Dewan Harris and Jalen Wilson that are similar and from TCU it's a very similar team to what it was a season ago so what does that mean now you look at the game in Fort Worth that happened last year Kansas was just so lethargic that was one of the the games where and it was weird because for Kansas to to win the Big 12 outright they had to win that game um and and they didn't they ended up winning a share of the Big 12 but that was what was kind of weird about it. It was like you have this opportunity in front of you and it's kind of lethargic, like lazy, lack of energy game for Kansas. And TCU just beat them up on the glass. KU actually kept it close at half and then they kind of pulled away. The game that was in Lawrence was plenty of energy for KU. They got out to a big lead. TCU chipped back away. And then it was just a good game, kind of clunky down the stretch that KU was able to fight through to win. And if you remember, that was the last week of the regular season last year that KU had the first game against TCU moved because of I believe it was some COVID stuff maybe it was the the weather I don't remember and you ended up playing three games in the final week of the regular season with the TCU games back to back playing them on like a Tuesday and a Thursday or um, just kind of having that that short turnaround Um, so that was kind of interesting with the matchups last year we'll see how they go this year because again different enough from Kansas but still a lot of similarities with TCU And in both games, TCU gave you a lot of trouble. Now, when you met in the Big 12 semifinals last season, that was all Kansas. You just destroyed them. That was uh, uh, the fun Ochag Baji dunk game. He had all sorts of fun dunks last year. But um, yeah, KU kind of ripped through them last season in the Big 12 tournament. We'll see which one this is more closer to. I kind of lean toward it being more closer to the one in Allen Fieldhouse last year where you kind of expect Kansas to win, but it's probably going to be a close game down the stretch, which stop me if you've heard that before with uh, one of these home games so far in Allen Fieldhouse. Uh, The next storyline, two top-tier Big 12 title threats. Now, for TCU, they're far from being in the driver's seat because they have lost three games already. They're three and three after they lost to West Virginia earlier this week. But, like, you know, they're, they're still one of the teams that, 
is seen as one of the better teams in the Big 12. And if they win this game, now all of a sudden you're four and three, you have a road win against the the Big 12 title favorite at this point. Um, I don't know what that does for them. Certainly teams like Texas and Kansas State and Iowa State being in front of them makes it hard that you don't really expect them at this point to win the Big 12. But like they're still one of the better teams there in that regard. And if they are going to go on a run to try to get back into it, like this is a game that they probably need to win. Otherwise, you just view them as at that point, three and four, and you expect, you know, four or five losses to win the Big 12. They wouldn't really have any uh, more losses to give at that point. Then they're probably more of just a, hey, what are they going to do for the NCAA tournament? But for Kansas, obviously, this does have very much uh, a heavy weight on can they win the Big 12 or not? You got to win games like this when you have Kansas State and Iowa State winning all these other games and, and trying to keep up with them and Texas right behind them as well. The last big storyline here is the Big 12 Player of the Year candidates. Jalen Wilson's probably the front runner right now, I would think. I mean, Marquise Noel, the way that he started Big 12 play, uh, he would certainly be in that conversation. Keontae Johnson would certainly be in that conversation. I mean, Gabe Kalsher has been really good in Big 12 play. I don't know that he has the counting stats, but you know, you, you toss his name out there. Marcus Carr has been really good. But Mike Miles for TCU has been uh, electric so far this season. The counting stats look really good. He's averaging 19 points per game. He's shooting over 50% from the field. Three-point percentage is, is a little lower than maybe you'd expect it, but also he always has been kind of a tough shot taker and maker, so he'll hit some tough ones, but he also will have games where maybe he misses a lot of threes and he'll take contested ones, and um, that's kind of the case for Jalen Wilson, too. Like, you look at the efficiency numbers, they're not great, but also he is one of the few players on his specific team that is being asked to create shots like Grady Dick gets shots created for him. He works off movement. And part of it is him creating them just off the ball though. Like as far as creating offense on the ball, Jalen Wilson's kind of the one guy for Kansas. Like Dewan can create for other players every so often. Maybe he weaves through and hits like a floater. Um, but Jalen's kind of the one consistent guy for TCU. They have other players who can score. They have other players who can, you know, create in different ways, but the one guy consistently creating offense off the dribble is Mike Miles. So in that regard, they're kind of similar there, but both players are big 12 player of the year candidates. Wilson averaging over 20 points, nearly nine rebounds per game coming off that unbelievable performance against Kansas state where he had 38 points miles looking to, you know, put up a big performance in Allen Fieldhouse that gets everybody's attention. He obviously has the ability to to pop off from three in a given game and has been so efficient at slithering into lane and hitting those two-point shots. He can facilitate a little bit. He's just a really good player. So you have two Big 12 Player of the Year candidates with Miles against Wilson. Not that they're really going to be matched up. KU does switch, so maybe there will be a possession or two where they end up getting switched onto each other. But overall, it's it's more about you just have one on each specific team and which player is going to have the bigger performance, which player is going to kind of carry their team to the win and the finish line. That'll kind of be fun to watch from two of the premier players in the conference. We're going to get on to our TCU scouting report in just a second here. But first, this episode of Locked on Jayhawks is brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting information, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college basketball season to soccer, the Premier League starting back up. They've got it all at BetOnline.net. If you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. They're the fastest and easiest way to get your betting information. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline where the game starts. TCU comes into this game at 14 and four on the season. They are three and three in big 12 play. When you look at what they did in the non-con, like the very early portion of the season, it was like, ah, oh, this team might've been overhyped because if you remember last year, they were a good team, got the nine seed in the NCAA tournament and they gave Arizona all they could handle. Honestly, probably should have beat Arizona and they got, you know, maybe a little bit screwed at the end of regulation with, with a foul and uh, they couldn't, you know, stop, uh, Oh, gosh, what's his name? The uh, Benedict Matherin for for Arizona now off into the NBA with the Pacers. And, um, you know, you lost a close game, but it showed how good the team was. And then they bring all these players back and the expectations were like top 15 team, true Big 12 title contender. They started the season playing Arkansas Pine Bluff, ranked 335th on Ken Palm. They only beat them by one. Lamar, who's ranked 359th on Ken Palm, only beat them by 11. 
and then against Northwestern State, who's ranked 243rd, and they lost by one. And it's like, what is going on with this team? But after that, they kind of bounced back a little bit. They had they had a win by 13 over Iowa, who's a top 30 team, win by 13 over Providence, who's a top 35 team. Uh, they beat SMU by eight, who's like, you know, fine, kind of middle of the pack. They beat Utah um, in a semi-away game, who's a top 70 team. And then they started Big 12 play. They had just the one loss. You beat Texas Tech by six when Tech was was more healthy. You beat Baylor on the road. That was a really impressive win by a point. And then they had a, a close home loss to Iowa State, close road loss at Texas, a game that they probably felt like they blew. I mean, they were up nearly 20 points at halftime. They did beat Kansas State, one of the premier Big 12 teams, in their last Saturday game, and then a tough loss on the road against West Virginia. So none of those Big 12 losses are bad or um you know, like stick out. It's just the big 12 is very hard. And sometimes you got to win on the margins and they haven't won some of those on the margins, but they did get the Baylor game kind of on the margins there, but this is a good team overall. Uh, when you look at what they do, well, they've been a really good defense, like top 25 defense in the country. They're outside the top 70 though. Offensively, they haven't been super efficient. They played a really fast tempo, which I think every time I see that, I love hearing that for Kansas because of the fact that I think Kansas likes to play up and down, and so I think that is going to make the game very, very fun. Now, you look at Ken Palm, it projects Kansas to win 77 to 68, so it's projecting for about 145 points. I'd be comfortable actually going the over there because of the, the tempo stuff, both sides, but then again, this could be a physical game that the score gets kind of brought down. If the spread is nine, though, that just goes back in line. Like any spread in the Big 12 where it's eight or more, I'm just taking the team getting eight or more. It, it just seems like that's the the smart play there. But um, when you look at what TCU does well offensively, they avoid turnovers really well. Uh, they they crash the offensive glass super well. Last season, they were like one of the, the best teams. This year, they're elite at it, but they're not like one of the very best at it. Uh, but that's still a calling card for them and caused Kansas issues last year. They get to the free throw line a ton and they shoot two point shots at a very high rate. They don't get the ball stolen. The one thing they don't really do well is they cannot shoot threes. They are 346th in the country in three-point percentage at 28.7%. They are also 336th in the amount of their field goals that are attempted that are threes. So they don't take a lot of threes, and they don't make them at a very high rate either. And in Big 12 play, that number is even down further. They are only at 24.7% from three in Big 12 play. They actually have turned the ball over at one of the bottom half rates in the Big 12 and Big 12 only games, which, you know, that'll be interesting to see which way it goes in this game. But uh, they uh, that's basically it. They, they shoot well inside. They get a bunch of their misses but they miss a lot from the outside on the defensive side of the ball. What makes them so good? Stop me. If you've heard this before, they turn you over They're top 20 in the country in turnover rate defensively. They are top 30 in the country in steal rate defensively. They're top 30 in the country in non steel turnover rates so like charges and some of those other things. Uh, they're top 35 in block rate. They are top 30 in defending the three point line. Maybe you would say some of that is luck, but I think they have a lot of length and athleticism that makes it difficult out there. And they're also top 65 in preventing the amount of shots that you take from three, which tells me they are chasing teams off the three-point line and that they are a good three-point defense team. They um, aren't as good at two-point defense, but they're still good at it. And in Big 12 play, that has been something that's been exploited. They're eighth in conference-only games in two-point defense, but overall for the season, they are 82nd in the country. So where that kind of lies is going to be interesting. Now, as good of an offensive rebounding team as they are, the one bugaboo for the defense is their defensive rebounding. They are just 287th in the country in defensive rebounding rate. In Big 12 only games, they are 10th last among Big 12 teams in defensive rebounding rate. So both teams should have an opportunity to get offensive rebounds. KU, you might give up. 10, 12, 15 offensive rebounds in this game. But if you can get 12, 14, 15 back the other way, then it kind of neutralizes that advantage for TCU. And that could be something that you're looking for in this game. As far as the lineups for TCU that they're going to throw out there, um, Mike Miles, I, I guess it depends how you view it. Like Damian Baugh is the bigger guard. He's six foot four. Mike Miles is six foot two. Baugh's going to get, he, he gets about five assists per game. Miles is closer to about three. Um, so technically, Baugh is the point guard, but in terms of how KU is going to defend it, I would imagine Dewan is on Miles, and then you probably put, at that point, I guess, like Grady Dick on, on Damian Baugh, maybe put Kevin McCuller to try to cut the head off the snake, so to speak. But Baugh and Miles is a really good one-two punch. Baugh is a really physical guard who can crash the glass. He gets assists. He'll get a, 
a handful of rebounds per game. He can score in a myriad of ways. Miles is kind of the lightning bug offensive scorer. Um, Chuck O'Bannon is, is kind of their, their swingman three guy. He's just kind of a, a glue guy filler piece. We'll see what Micah Peavy's health status is. He's missed, I think, the last three games for them. He's a good little bench wing that provides more of that physicality off the bench for them. Um, and then the, their front court is really interesting because you have Emmanuel Miller, who's a six foot seven, uh, who at times was playing a small ball five at Texas A&M before he transferred to TCU. Now he's playing the four spot, but he is kind of a wing. He can really shoot it limited sample size from three. Like it's not a huge number, but he'll take like two a game and he's shooting nearly 50% on three point shots this year. Really efficient player can drive and dribble. The good news for Kansas is they're playing a mobile four as well that should be able to contend with him eddie lampkin down low is interesting he is a load inside six foot 11 263 pounds he gives a lot of teams trouble because of his size and strength he's been very hit or miss he'll have games where he has four points four rebounds 4.7 rebounds and then he'll have games where he is the best player on the court he has 20 points and 11 rebounds or like against kansas state he was dominant inside and, and kind of playing bully ball so we'll see what it is this game um, and I think part of that's probably matchup dependent on on what the other center is like K-State. Their centers are, are more like string bean types that are really athletic pogo sticks that Lampkin might be able to push around. Adams is a very strong player inside, but he doesn't have the height of Lampkin. We'll see how that matchup goes for KU. But uh, he's been kind of hit or miss whether, like I said, he's been just, you know, an average Big 12 center or if he has been like looking like an all big 12 player uh, kind of game to game between those two. But in terms of those matchups, like it is interesting because KU really does uh, match up. I, I think pretty evenly when you just look at like the body types or like the position players you're trying to use. If you have to on Mike miles, those are two quick point guards and you're trying to cut off a guy who scores a lot with a good defender, uh, Damian Baugh, and Chuck O'Bannon and then Emmanuel Miller, that's six four, six, 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 seven across the wings. Okay, well, KU plays three wings, which are similar sized. And at the center position, even though Lampkin has the height on KJ, the strength thing is kind of both there for both guys, even if for Lampkin it might be a little more. Uh, we'll wait and see on Saturday. But I think it should be a fun matchup. And uh, if if KU can kind of slow down Emmanuel Miller, Mike Miles, and, and not have Eddie Lampkin have one of those games. You should feel really, really good about where this one is, and that's probably would be how Kansas covers the spread. But that's asking a lot to try to shut down all of those three players because they're all very, very good players. All right, we're going to get into our matchups of the game in just a second. But first, this episode of Locked on Jayhawks is brought to you by Built Bar. Looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories? Then you got to try Built Bar. They're so delicious you won't think they're good for you, but they are, and they're perfect for your New Year's resolution because of that. What makes them so good? For starters, they're all covered in 100% real chocolate, and they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, and coconut almond. I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. They are just 130 calories, just 4 grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box. You've always been able to, and you still can order them at built.com, but you can also get them now at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. Head to your nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section, grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. And if you're close to a Sam's Club, run in, grab a 13-bar box with hit flavors like brownie batter and churro. Built Bar, you can thank me later. Finishing things up on this edition of the show with our matchups of the game. Uh, coming up on our Monday show, we'll be recapping the KU-TCU game. We'll probably fit a KU-Baylor preview into that episode as well. Maybe we'll do two episodes. I don't know. Haven't decided yet. Um, but, you know, it'll be a quick turnaround next week with a uh, big Monday for KU against Baylor. But matchups of the game for this one. Kansas-TCU. Um, I think KU defensive rebounding versus the TCU offensive glass. Uh, like I said, that that's something that that certainly sticks out in this matchup. Last season, TCU was really able to attack you on the offensive glass, and for them this year, like they do it at a really elite level as well. Now, last year they were number one in the country in offensive rebounding rate. This year they're in the top twenty-five, but they're still again very very good at it. And um, like I go back to the game that um, they beat Kansas in TCU, it was seventy-four to sixty-four. They had twelve offensive rebounds. Or, or I'm sorry, Kansas had 12 offensive rebounds. TCU had 19 offensive rebounds. Kansas had 23 defensive rebounds. So you can see how that could be very much a problem. In the game that was played in Lawrence, um, TCU had just eight offensive rebounds, though, while Kansas had 21 defensive rebounds. So, like, they're going to get their offensive rebounds. That's part of what they do well. It's a skill for them. 
but just don't let it take over the game, essentially. And for Kansas, as I talked about, they should be able to get offensive rebounds too. K.J. Adams, good offensive rebounder. You have a couple other good offensive rebounders at the wing position. TCU hasn't been great at defensive rebounding. So if you can hold them to 10 to 12 offensive rebounds, you should be able to get 8 to 12 yourself, and that would be a huge win for Kansas to kind of take away one of their strengths. But if they get 18 offensive rebounds like they did in Fort Worth, there's where you lose the game. Uh, Three-point shooting, certainly a matchup of the game. For Kansas, can they bounce back? You had a really bad three-point shooting game against Kansas State, but as we talked about, TCU has done a really good job of preventing three-point shooting from the opposition so far. They have lengthy wings. They're athletic. They get out. They contest shots. They deny you being able to even get those threes off, but Kansas needs more of a you know a punch from the outside than they got their last game. I'm still waiting on if like a guy like Grady Dick can start hitting from 25, 27 feet on these deep threes, because that would really open up the spacing even more. And it would make it even more difficult for teams to face guard him. But we haven't really seen that him be able to hit those super deep ones. It's, it's been a couple times, um, but obviously him coming off a one eight performance from three, you'd like to see him bounce back. I expect he will, but it's going to be tough against this athletic TCU team. Now the three point shooting for TCU, as I talked about, they have been horrid at it, but also, this just feels like the most Kansas thing ever that TCU, of course, that means they're going to come in and they're going to go like 10 of 22 from three. That's just what happens, right? So uh, you just hope if you're Kansas that those numbers stay the same and that they don't have one of those unearthly shooting games. There are four really, really fun player matchups. I, I think from just a team perspective, like there might not be more fun individual player matchups than when these two teams go up at it. Like, the Kansas State one had two great ones with Keontae Johnson versus Kevin McCullers defense or Dewan Harris uh, guarding Marquise Noel. But there, I, I don't know that there were as many as this one because you look across the lineup, they play so similarly. And like KJ Adams versus Eddie Lampkin, I'm super interested to see how that goes. You have KJ Adams, who's more mobile. Eddie Lampkin, though, has all this size and strength in the world. But KJ is a strong player, and that is kind of his strength, that he's not the longest guy in the world or whatever, but he is very strong. So can you go toe-to-toe with him and keep him from having a huge game? Mike Miles versus Dewan Harris, if that's the matchup for KU. Dewan Harris, um, you know, being a really good defender, trying to slow down Mike Miles and make him more inefficient in this game. And then you have Grady Dick possibly versus Damian Baugh. Like, how will Dick deal with the possible physicality that Damian Baugh brings and he'll really crash the offensive glass can Grady Dick do a good job of boxing him out and avoiding those key possessions can he deal with his physicality when he's on offense um Jalen Wilson versus Emmanuel Miller you have two kind of stretch forwards with versatility that that really add a a big flavor to their team's offenses like who's going to win that matchup that's a really fun one in Miller's case he's averaging over 14 points per game Jalen's obviously averaging over 20 those are really fun individual player matchups that are going to help determine this game at the same point in time I don't know how much we're going to see them because we know Kansas switches a lot um Kansas versus Kansas State they switched a lot early Eventually, they they changed up from that, and they were basically like, no, we need you to chase around the screen on Johnson or Noel to avoid them killing us. So we'll see how it goes in this game. I would imagine they switch early. If Mike Miles or someone is killing them on switches, I bet you it's just, hey, Dewan, chase him around the screen and, and see what you can do. But it's it's impossible to know how all these matchups are going to go because of all that switch stuff. But if we do get some of the matchups, like, yeah, it, uh, I'm really excited to see how some of those kind of work out for you. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of Locked on Jayhawks. We'll be back Monday to recap the KUTCU game, and we'll talk a little KU Baylor, too, with Big Monday ahead for that one. If you have anything you want the show to talk about, hit me up on Twitter, at D Johnson Radio. You can uh, subscribe to our show wherever you get any of your podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube. That'll do it for today. Have a good rest of the day. I'll see some of you on Rock Chalk Sports Talk later today. Bye.